Luke and Sarge here from the Young Professionals Podcast. Luke, who do we have on the show today? Sarge, today we're talking with James Moore, who is an analyst in the project, project finance team at ANZ Bank in Melbourne. James studied a double degree of a Bachelor of Commerce and a Bachelor of Laws at Deakin University in Burwood, where he also completed a diploma of Chinese language, which he has continued to learn uh, to this day. James completed myriad internships during his time at uni, both in commerce and on the law side of things, uh, before landing a vacation role and a clerkship positions at top tier law firms and ANZ Bank uh, in his penultimate year of study. James eventually accepted a graduate offer from ANZ in 2018, which he completed in June of this year. Currently in the process of being admitted as an Australian lawyer, James has covered many disciplines in his short career, which we are really keen to unpack with him today. James, welcome to the show, mate. Thanks, Lou. Thanks, Sarge. Nice to be here with you both. Oh, it's good to have you on. Um, mate, I think a good place to start with you is to really unpack what it means to be in the project finance team or a young analyst working at you know, what, probably one of the bigger employers in Australia in ANZ Bank. Why don't you run us through what you're doing day to day now, now that you've finished the grad program quite recently, and then we can have a chat about what that program actually entails and, and, and work a little bit backwards from there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and yeah, both being two very different topics of conversation because now I am focusing on a specialization within the project finance side of things, which um, for those that do not know, it's, it's, being in ANZ and the institutional division, we look at funding um, large uh, large scale projects within Australia and internationally. ANZ has a focus on the Asia Pacific region, so there is um, scope throughout those regions as well. Um, but the team centrally focuses on large infrastructure, um, energy resources, mining, those sorts of um, industries and it's all about um, understanding those projects, understanding the risks, understanding uh, basically from a finance perspective, the future cash flows of those projects and, and how we can understand really from a financial position, um, how they will, whether it's in a construction phase or operations phase, how they perform over time. And the thing that I really enjoy about the role is that it brings in a whole range of skills that aren't just purely numbers and financial specifics. So in terms of understanding a project, there's obviously a lot of legal risks. There's obviously a lot of engineering and construction risk. Um, and that all feeds into really it comes, th those things also come down to numbers and, and how you can interpret those and basically forecast and future plan for those. Um, because realistically we're, we're lending money, we're putting money out the door to um, assist these projects um, being built and operated and you've got to understand how you can realistically get that back in the end. Um, and on the legal risk side of things, documentation, legal documentation governs everything we do, our, our relationships with our customers and, and the terms that we provide funding on. So you've got to understand those risks, risks first of all. Um, we're not uh, lawyers by practice. So, so we obviously seek external counsel, um, from those like yourself, Luke, and we understand those risks and those, um, those terms and the relationship we engage with the various parties within a, a project kind of sphere, I'd say there's, there's multiple parties being sponsors, um, there's contractors, there's a whole range of parties that need to be, um, or you need to have documentation that um, provides the structure for those, um, I guess, those interactions and and how you achieve the end goal of, of starting from scratch to building the project and operating it. Um, Just on that, James, before we go um, into too much further detail, uh, some of our listeners are, you know, in, in year 12 and, and even year 11 um, and maybe even a little bit younger at school. Like I remember mm. going through an internship, um, you know, interview process for, for NAB once and I was walking around the building and I said, 
you know, uh, it's it's really uh, fascinating how this big bank makes so much money just off mum and dad investors with, with savings accounts. So if if we're talking to, say, some younger people that might have, you know, that their account at ANZ that they get paid into from their part-time job, do you want to just go into what institutional banking is as opposed to, say, retail banking with, with you know, people um, and their savings accounts? That's the, And that's the question I, I was going to say to you guys, what do you think we do at a bank? And I'll be honest, when I was at school, and when I was at uni and pretty much up until, well, I'd like to say day one of my internship, it could have been halfway through. Um, <laughs> I thought it was just mum and dad's and okay, you might provide credit cards, you might provide a home loan and that's really what you do. And I think that was the biggest eye opener for me within the internship program, which really opened up the window of opportunity to go into banking because not only is there a wide variety of pathways you can take in terms of the customer focus. So there can be the households, mums and dads, there can be small businesses, there can be, there's, there's the agri side of things. So you can pursue re- regional opportunities and there's actually a full uh, program for uh, the agri side of things. And then you can look at technology, you can look at data, there's programs within that space as well. Um, and then you can also, so there's the business bank side of things, but then you can go to the institutional side, which is large corporates. So if you think um, the ASX 200 or, or those large publicly listed companies, um, if you have a search online or if you listen to the news, you'll hear them uh, mentioned quite often, like your BHP, your Rio or, or car manufacturers, those global uh, organisations. That's really the focus of institutional banking. And um, what I didn't think I understood whilst even at uni was that these organisations largely operate with debt as well as equity funding. Um, and they're two different types of, I guess, what, you call a capital structure and and that's how these businesses operate and debt plays a pretty key role in that and within the institutional bank we provide that funding and that is really only one aspect of within the institutional bank what you actually do as well there is um, a lot of transactional flow so if you're looking at just us as an example in our own uh, personal daily life we're spending you have a credit card or a debit card and you'll pay um, when you go to the uh, local cafe with the fpos machines and all that kind of transactional money flow is something that banks assist with and mm. it, it doesn't just happen magically <laughs> <laughs> exactly right you don't just tap and somehow just goes somewhere and you have no idea but um, it's where a lot of the innovation is at the moment too, which is, it's been a really interesting aspect of, um, my learning at the bank and, and what we got to explore in the graduate program. Um, we actually had a, a graduate project and it's something that all graduates do sort of by six months into the program being an 18 month program that we do at ANZ. And our focus was on our data and digital capabilities and how we're looking at building those out for our institutional customers. So it's, it's obvi- quite obvious how that innovation is happening in the, I guess, the retail or um, domestic, uh, uh, domestic focus with, say, we look at our ANZ app and mm. there's, there's a lot of change happening there. And um, you look at what's happening with, say, cryptocurrencies and, and distributed ledger technology and how those are being used. But mm. we're also looking at building that sort of through the broader institutional space. And so, um, yeah, that was something that I saw, which I thought, wow, like when I was at uni or school, I never really thought that even happened or I wasn't really aware that it happened. It it certainly certainly sounds like there's a lot going on at ANZ and it's it's much broader than just a bank um, holding mum and dad's money. Um, mm. You mentioned before you you the ANZ grad program is an eighteen month program. Um, did you you rotated through the institutional bank team there? What um, you do three rotations? What rotations did you do? And um, how did you go about choosing those particular areas? Yeah, good, good question. Um, so at a broader level, so within 
ANZ, there's institute, uh, there, sorry, there's graduate programs that follow different streams. So you can follow a technology stream, an agri stream, or say the retail bank side of things. What's, what's agri for those listening at home? Oh, agribusiness. So supporting farms, um, the equipment they need. To be honest, I'm probably not the right person to be talking it through, but um, it's it's a really interesting side of it because we got to engage with those graduates quite often. That's something I thought they do really well is they bring everyone together and we have development days and those sorts of things. And um, it's got a good reputation, the, the agri program. Um, it's difficult because you're obviously sent to regional areas and you're operating in a what might be a bit of an isolated environment, but being farm, most are farmers and mm. they uh, obviously found it a great opportunity to connect their sort of learnings and education from university to their own home uh, roots, really. Um, oh, it sounds like a great part of a, a grad program. It's such a, it would seem that that's a big positive working somewhere that is so large and had such a broad reach. It's like, you know, you mm. could be working for, as you said, a, a big corporate who has a head office in Melbourne, but you could also be working for a massive farmer out in country Victoria, for example. Um, yeah. Funding their their capital expenditure or, or whatever it might be. Yeah, exactly. And and so you generally will try and pursue one of those streams. And I look to, to build my career within the institutional space. And within our program, there was uh, three six-month rotations. And the idea is really to build a diverse range of experiences. And and those who lead the program are really strong in, in – um, ensuring as a graduate you do try different things and you do make the most of that because there's a lot of people who leave university or when you're at university you think oh this is this is me this is absolutely what i want to do i'm not going to do anything else and the stereotype within banking is i guess generally the markets side of things which you watch wolf of wall street or or whatever and you go that's me i want to be that uh, big money maker and and that's it but oh, it's, it's, it's tangible it's what it's what people can see yeah, exactly. Exactly. And you're not, you don't, you're not open to what opportunities are really out there. So you, you think that's sort of it and that's all you can do. But, um, did you fall into that bucket? mate? <laughs> no, I, to be honest, I personally didn't find myself as a, as a trader. Um, and for those that don't know, a trader is basically someone who, uh, if you if you do watch Wolf of Wall Street, you see them on the floor, they're on the phone, they're, they're high paced and they're Screaming. Got the, yeah, exactly right. The screaming, buy, 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 sell, all that kind of stuff. And I am someone who probably enjoys taking a bit of time on uh, projects that I work on. So I, at university, for example, assignments were more my thing than exams because I could sort of work at something, think it through and really plan out my approach. Um, and I found that sort of fit nicely with the role I'm currently in because these deals take a long time to execute on and and there are things that move at a very high pace um, and require a lot of um, a lot of time and effort uh, but it's a different approach to, to getting things done um, and in terms of my program in itself I I actually so I started my first rotation in an industry-based team and at um, or in institutional banking, that's generally called a coverage team, and they manage the relationship with the customer. Um, so that um, they manage the relationship with the customer as well as the the what's known as I guess the credit analysis of that customer as well. So understanding what their financial performance is like, what's happening in their industry what risks might be um, on the horizon and, and having a forward looking perspective of what that customer is like really. And I personally really enjoyed the relationship side of things. Um, it's, it's basically connecting the customer with the bank and bringing them to us and then bringing everything from our side to the customer because there's a whole right wide range of, I guess what we call products that we can um, bring to the customer yet they're all various different teams within the bank and being such a large organization it's half the half the time is spent I guess connecting those people and bringing in what's needed um, and 
the the thing I really enjoyed about it as well was that it was industry focused and for me, I joined the resources, energy and infrastructure team. So it's quite a neat parallel with the team I'm in at the moment. Um, and that team at this, for, for that uh, coverage rotation, they focus on the corporate themselves. So the, whether it's a BHP, for example, um, they look at bringing the whole suite of, I guess, services and products that we provide as a bank to that corporate entity. Um, uh, by the sounds of things, I think that's a positive of a grad rotation, as I said, in, in a big corporate because they do service each and every part of, say, the bank services are many different parts of a business and if you get to rotate um, around those different teams, if like once you do settle or you, you know you eventually start working in a team then you might not you probably won't be touching all those different parts but during the grad program you really get to get a good taste of you know what the the, the um, equities team does or what the what the debt team does or whatever there might be and I think that's similar in a lot of different corporate graduate um, programs and that's really the beauty of them are the different rotations so you can get a taste of it um, which is great absolutely yeah yeah mate, just, just taking it oh sorry you go didn't mean to cut you off i was just going to say to that point it's something that i see is really widely encouraged and needed within the organization you look at the leadership team and um there's not one sort of clear path that well there, there's some bit that have worked from i guess the lower levels to the top ranks all in the one kind of focus but the majority of people move between skill sets and and focus points and I think that was something that really attracted me to the program and, and to that kind of career. Um, I looked at banking on one side and I looked at law on another and both were really good opportunities. But for me, what kind of felt constraining was on the legal side, you look at a, um, you look at a practice area, whether it be intellectual property or, or corporate being mergers and acquisitions where, where Luke and I had actually met. And um, I kind of saw that I, I didn't have that clear direction in my head that that's exactly what I wanted to do. And so when I saw the opportunity um, within institutional banking or, or even a wider corporate bank um, to be able to try new things and have that real focus on building a broad skill set, um, I thought that was an awesome opportunity. And it's not something that you just focus on within the graduate program. It's actually something that um, continues on throughout the career. I think that's great. And, and it sounds like a, a fantastic program that I'm sure is, um, you know, widely known, uh, known in industry. And that's a point I, I want to bring up um, later is that when kids are, or students rather are going through the back end of uni and looking into get internships or, or clerkship programs or whatever it is. It's really doing your market research on the particular industry, uh, rather companies that you're going to be going to apply for and understanding, right, just take your example, ANZ has a fantastic graduate program and that's widely known in the market, but you're not really going to figure out what programs are good and what programs are maybe not so good um, in terms of getting out of them what you really want to. And say you are you really love, um, I don't know, M&A law and you're going into a clerkship and you're like, that's all I want to do. And you know that that particular program, you only get one rotation and you can get it in there and that's fine. That might be fantastic. Um, but if you're like yourself and want to get really good exposure to different areas of a bank and you know that that particular grad program affords you that ability to, to rotate, then that's a good option for you. Um, just taking a left turn and going back a few years, I guess, let, let's talk about, um, your decision to undertake the, the double degree and, and the, um, and the diploma of languages as well. Where did the, where did the Chinese or Mandarin come from? How long have you been learning yeah. that and, and where did that, uh, where did that in, inspiration start? Yeah, look, to be honest, it wasn't much of an inspiration where it started. It was more, you had to do it from, uh, year three when I moved to, um, uh, Melbourne Grammar School and and that was just the the proviso that everyone studied Mandarin and I it just it just seemed to sort of come easy I kind of enjoyed it I kind of I think I got what what help was I got used to hearing it and so by just continuing that through junior school reached middle school and and I think everyone had to do two languages in year seven and I picked up French as well um kept that up until year eight and then realized learning two languages was just playing with me um so dropped the french pretty english quickly. is hard enough mate <laughs> still learning um, <laughs> but 
I kept up the Mandarin in senior school and then it wasn't really until I think it was year 11 when it became more of a, a, a I guess, a fork in the road, decide to keep up the language or, or drop it and, and I guess strategize what VCA subjects I wanted to do to get the best result. And it was quite funny, the, the head of Chinese at my school, he basically had said to all of us, my advice, don't do it in year 12, just drop it and focus on another VCA subject, do well in that, and you can pick it up after school. Um, just because the, the competitive environment was so difficult and I think it was, a, to be honest at the time, a pretty poor system for, for grading as well because the efforts and the, I think the skills weren't reflected so well. But anyway. Did you listen to him? No, certainly not. <laughs> and uh, he was right, let me tell you. Uh, I, <laughs> it was definitely my, what was it, the sixth subject that uh, doesn't get counted towards your, your result. But that actually acted as a bit of an impetus for me to get something more out of it. So when I got to uni, I thought, gee, so I've, I've gone and done it for VCA, which was a bit of a slog in itself. And, and I really should get something more out of it. And I enjoyed it, but it wasn't, wasn't something that I could necessarily see the practicality of too much because I hadn't even been to China at that stage. And so when you're learning a language, the best part of it is actually speaking it in the country it's spoken um, or the places that it is spoken. And so I decided to start again at uni and that was just like school classes and um, two two a week, nothing too um, comprehensive, but I was enjoying it. And a program came on offer for an in-country experience and it was six weeks intensive language program where you spend all day uh, five days a week, uh, studying Chinese within a university there. And it's, I thought, you know what, like at this stage as well, but after leaving school, I want to travel. This is, this sounds like a whole lot of fun and going to a new place and meeting new people. Um, it was with, uh, the class of students that I, I was with at Deakin university and I didn't really know anyone. And, um, I think that was been, my, whilst at uni and my time since, that's been probably the best aspect of studying the language is just the range of people I've met through the experience. Where Whereabouts in China did you go? Yeah, so we went to Nanjing in, in China, um, in the Jiangsu province, and it is a beautiful city. It's, it's an old capital, um, very old capital, and very well known for its universities. I think Monash Uni has a, a campus there, and there's a lot of... Um, bilateral relationships between unis and and Nanjing um and we attended a uni there lived on campus and it was yeah absolutely beautiful campus and we got to sort of I think we'd study from 8 30 till 12 and then maybe an hour or so in the afternoon and get the rest of the day off so um and you have weekends off as well so it was awesome sort of hanging out with all the other students and then going and exploring some of the other closer cities like shanghai uh, on the weekends and yeah, unreal uh, you, yeah, you, you mentioned in in year 12 that it was, you know you're figuring out the strategic way of choosing your um subjects and whatnot like is the mm-hmm. um and i guess what i'm touching on is that the more that we as a country deal with China and other um, Mandarin speaking um, countries or where people are from in terms of business, when you are applying to graduate programs or whatnot after university in in any real um, area, basically, if you can speak any other language other than English, but particularly Mandarin, it's seen as a positive thing. Was was, Was developing that skill after school a strategic standpoint as well, or was it purely just something that you were interested in um, from a curricular standpoint that's a good question and it's i I feel like my own interpretation of it gets blurred because everyone i speak to they go oh that's great for the resume or that'll do you wonders in your career and i go yeah but really hasn't been something that i've looked at and pursued a hundred percent because of that reason i don't think i could have um it's I, i think that's that's the same for a lot of disciplines whether it's a language or knowledge other knowledge sets but I always knew it would help and it would put me in good stead, but it was something that I wanted to do. So for example, if 
professionally, it would help me because one day I could go to China and I could engage with clients um, locally, then that's something I actually wanted to do. It wasn't Mm. as if I heard that was a a good thing. So that was the best part about it. Um, It was because it was actually something I wanted to do. And Mm. I really have enjoyed engaging with people from a different um, cultural background. Um, I actually laid it down the track while still at uni, um, applied for an internship in Shanghai. And um, to be honest, it's, it's a, bit of a shout out to the programs that are offered out there because I thought internships and all of those structural programs were things that you, you follow that pretty straight path that we have here in Australia of, of there's a specific time in your university uh, career, I guess, that you apply for those things. And, and if you don't get it, you don't get it. And well, try and find whatever go, you can go do. Go and do to, your masters. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> exactly right. Um, and I think it was what's known as my, uh, the pre-penultimate year at uni. So three years from finishing. Um, Otherwise known was, as first year for a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not when you're doing six years at uni like me. No. Um, but that was, and that's to be honest, that's something I really enjoyed about my uni experience was that I took my time with things, um, doing a double degree being five years and the Chinese kind of, uh, fattened that out to six. And I think that gave me a great opportunity to go and do like a language program, um, in my third year or second year, which as you said, um, for the friends of mine who went to Melbourne Uni, they were they were finishing up their degrees by that point. Mm. Um, well, on that, mate, like when you are choosing a university degree, and uh, like I've I've done, uh, we well, Sarge and I both done double degrees as well, and mm. you know, mine pushed into the six and a half years because I took some, I made part time at the back end and whatnot. But um, it certainly wasn't something that I did a lot of thinking about when I was balancing up. Say I was interested in business as well, so I was considering you know commerce degrees and, and whatnot. Um, their three years, I didn't really take a lot of time to think, well, if I do this, I'll only be at uni for three years and then I'll be able to go into the full-time workforce theoretically. But this way I'm kind of doubling the time I'm, I'm at uni. Ended up really uh, being uh, grateful for making the decision to be there for so long. But is that something yeah. that you considered when you were choosing the double degree? Absolutely and, not. Yeah. Absolutely not. Um, and you might even be told it, but for me personally, it wasn't something that really weighed on my decision-making process. Um, Do you think it should be for people? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think understanding what the structure of a course entails bec- because for those who I mate, mates of mine who, who'd done a three year course, it gets quite serious by the start of second year because you, you sort of over that, uh, that, that lull period where it's first year out of school and you have a bit of fun, you, you're still learning, you're meeting new people. You have to again think about what sort of employment experiences you want to um, apply for and, and gain at a very early stage. Um, it's a big decision as a 19, 20-year-old. Yeah, like, like studying something which I would say for most is new uh, for a year and then having to make a decision or, or be prepared to pursue something that you might not be so familiar with. Um, I think it rushes a lot of maturity into it. Um, Mm -hmm. and not to say that those who have done those, um, degrees haven't gone back and studied something else after. And, and what's to say that doing a double degree concurrently is better than, than doing two separately, like a lot to a, a Juris Doctor after studying an undergraduate degree. And that's a fantastic pathway. But I think what has afforded um, me a really good opportunity, and uh, it's the same as you, I think, Luke, too, is that our programs, by doing it concurrently, allowed us to do university exchanges and, and a whole range of things uh, say from the second year to fourth year where you, you sort of are building up towards the end. Whereas mm-hmm. if you were doing two, say three year degrees, um, back, back to back, you, you're kind of hitting those serious stages, um, midway through and then later on. So. Oh, and I don't know about you, but I didn't, I didn't find out about this stuff until, you know, second or third year uni, like oh, it gives you time to not. understand it as well. Yeah, it gives you time to, to meet new people, uh, reach out and try and understand what's really just out there. Um, mm. It's hard to make a decision about what you want to do when you don't know what's there. 
Oh, completely agree. And I think as well, um, that longer time of uni, it's a maturity curve. It's mm-hmm. almost like you're treading water, um, learning how the world works and what's out there. Getting and, your first job and, yeah, and doing but like, all those Just like how things. people interact and like just little things that I don't think you don't get taught at uni, but you just learn by going overseas or having your part-time job or, or volunteering somewhere. So I think that that's another um, big plus of doing a longer degree or doing a double degree. Um, James, you, you've also done a couple of clerkships before you got to A and Z. Um, what was the process for obtaining those like, and, um, what, what types of things were you doing at the law firms? Good questions. Um, and the process to obtain those experiences, I think is everyone, everyone who's gone through it can say is and vouch for is, is grueling. Um, but I think it's a really character building experience because it teaches you a lot of resiliency as well as confidence in yourself, because you've really got to believe in your own abilities and, and also understand what you want to do with yourself in that experience, because you're questioning what your skills are, you're questioning what, um, what, uh, avenues you want to pursue. So it takes a lot of that deeper thought. Um, but the odds, aren't in your favor. And so by nature of it, not everyone's going to get that experience. And I think it's really difficult because to, to pursue those opportunities, you've got to tell yourself that you are right for that. You it's, it's your thing and you really want it. And so it's kind of contradicting because you're telling yourself you deserve it and, and you're going to work hard towards it. But realistically the odds are quite challenging and so on that just to just to just to jump in when you say odds it's like yeah it kind of is odds but the people people the the firms that are looking to hire clerks are you know generally looking for things like um a lot of practical experience outside of uni how have you applied yourself obviously grades is is another thing but it's more so an attitude so to, to speak to that, and you've obviously got a lot of uh, a very colorful, colorful resume for someone that is relatively junior. Um, what were you doing, say, at uni, talking in terms of part-time jobs or volunteer experience or whatnot to really fill out that resume to, as you put it, like put the odds a little bit more in your favor mm. compared to everyone else? Yeah, absolutely. I think for me, I can only talk from my own experience. And for me, what worked was, was just chipping away at it, doing little bits here and there to, to build that sort of well-rounded professional profile that you want to present to, to recruiters. Um, I think having a language skill, which was also a passion that I had a strong interest in, that was something that it was a, a diverse experience. Um, but also starting at, I guess an earlier stage helped me. Um, as I was mentioning briefly earlier, I, in my pre penultimate year, just started sort of putting feelers out and seeing what opportunities were out there. And, um, I, I went on what was a paid internship. So I, I paid an organization to help sort of put me up in a, an apartment in Shanghai and they, um, reach out to sort of the network of organizations that they've sort of been in touch with and fortunately um i had i couldn't believe it at the time but it felt like unbelievable i wouldn't have been able to apply for this if i did but it was a global um commercial law firm that um had had actually recently merged at the time with china's second largest commercial law firm and so it was it was a really impressive organization to have on the cv but also a really awesome learning environment and i did all of that uh, three years from graduating. And so having just sort of little bits that you can, um, you can put on that resume or more so get, uh, some experience from, I think really helps. And I, I found throughout my time at uni, I, I never really took the opportunity to do volunteer work, which was something I personally as a, a human being really do enjoy. Um, I think a lot of people do and and I think it's something that's really worthwhile giving the time and effort towards because I think when you enter the stage or the transitional stages of applying for whether it's a program or if it's a, a job, um, 
what employers are looking for a lot of the time, as you mentioned, Luke, is the attitude and and the person behind the CV and and what you can bring to their um, culture and really what drives your decision making because you might be intelligent and you might have best grades, but that's ultimately not going to be the thing that drives your decisions within an organisation. So. Um, building out those experiences that aren't just, okay, you've got a certificate of this. Um, I think that really helps. So whether it is volunteering, it is um, travel experiences, um, I think going a bit left of centre uh, really helps. Um, not just sort of, I guess, not just following the paved path that seems to be the, the standard way of doing things um, really helps. And on that as well, the, the left of centre point, is something that certainly resonates with me and I know it does with Sarge because we've done kind of those left of center things um, in our time. But one, yeah, it makes you stand out on a resume. But two, the more you put yourself, particularly when you're young, in uncomfortable positions, and by that I mean, you know, if you're traveling, go to another country by yourself and just give yourself a week and go and see what that's like and Mm. go and figure it out by yourself or leave your phone in the hostel for a day and say, right, I'm going to go and see the city with no map, that kind of thing. Um, Sure, you might not be able to talk to that particular example on a resume, but the more you do those kinds of things, um, the more experience you have in yourself where it's like, oh, I've put myself in that situation and I got through it and I'm fine um, mm. and I'm, I'm more than fine. I'm better than I was before. So, uh, sure, it, it's good to be calculated to make sure that you stand out on a bit of paper. That's great. But to build your own repertoire of experiences that you can draw on when things get hard um, in work or uni or whatever, I think it's nothing but a good thing. Oh. Uh- Mate, that, that's that's the point. Um, it really resonates with me in sort of my last 18 months as well because the more you can push yourself to become uncomfortable and, and be comfortable being uncomfortable, I think it really sets you up so well in A, that transition period where you are applying for things or you're starting a new program at university or whatever. The more you can take opportunities and, and not doubt yourself or or feel like you need to always just keep within your safe space um it just sets you up for success because the the grads within my cohort um and those that i can see sort of coming through now the ones that do really well really quick are those who are just happy being themselves and aren't sort of second guessing what they can and can't do um so the more you can make yourself yeah um open to those uncomfortable experiences i think it just sets you up really well in in every aspect of your life, really. I think that's great advice, James. And on that, what advice would you give to yourself looking back that you might not have actually listened to uh, when you were younger? It's a good question. Um, I would say, well, one thing that I did a little bit of that I guess I referred to was starting early and, and, um, I did a little bit of, but I probably wouldn't have taken much credence from if someone had told me. Um, but I think it, I think it needs to come from somewhere within you that you actually, you really want to do it. So it's very easy for people to say, all right, no, make sure you're prepared to start pursuing a career and whatever you want to do early. Like you need to be doing this early. That doesn't, that kind of, for me was a bit of a a mental roadblock. Like, okay, great. But what am I going to do? Um, I think starting on things that you feel passionate about because the more that you do and the more that you put yourself out there, the more that comes. So um, it doesn't necessarily need to be, okay, you need to do an internship three years before you start work. Um, it's nothing prescriptive like that. I think it's it's just going out and putting yourself out there to try experiences. For example, with me going to China and studying a language and meeting new people those things just start rolling from there and, and you, you meet new people and those people want to help you. Everyone, everyone in the, this day and age, really, if, if you connect with them, they will want to help you in that process. So if you can, yeah, do more, meet, meet more people, I think it really puts you in a good position. I think on that as well, you know, ho- hopefully there's some more people listening um, from say year, year 11 and year 12 and people that aren't, you know, university is not on their radar. They might want to be going and doing a, a trade of some sort and, and uh, doing apprenticeships and going down that path and, and whatnot. But I think that advice is 
uh, is is relevant to to anyone. And to give some context, like putting yourself in an uncomfortable position or meeting new people can be, you know, say you're at first year uni, it can be, all right, for this semester, I'm going to go and introduce myself to a lecturer every week and have a conversation with a different person every week. Um, and if you can build up some kind of relationship with them, then, you know, you get 12 weeks down the track, you've met 12 people that you didn't know at the start of the year. Or, you know, if yeah. my, my brother's um, nearly finished a carpentry apprenticeship and I know when he was looking to do his pre-app, he would literally get on Google Maps, the different um, carpenters around the area and just rock up to their office and go and say, hi, I'm, uh, this is, this is me. Um, this is what I'm looking to do. Not really asking for a job, but you know, do you have any advice yeah. for me? And after six or seven weeks, he'd met kind of everyone in, in the, in the suburb. Um, and he had these little connections that he could work off. So it's really, you can take a bit of really, um, specific advice for someone that's at uni looking to get into a corporate world, but you can apply that anywhere. I think. hundred percent. And I think it's those principles that I that, that really sort of drive me more so than anything so nation specific to a field of um, expertise. I think, um, and and on that example, it's a genuine interest and effort that you you're referring to your brother, and and I think having that passion really drives those opportunities because he's obviously interested, he's obviously keen, and everyone sees that. And, and they're willing to help. Um, it's pretty hard to not, not to help someone who does come to you like that. No, for sure. Absolutely. I think, I think the big, the big takeaway there is, um, first and foremost, be a good person and, um, put yourself out there and then, um, good things will happen. Absolutely. Well, James, thanks for coming on the show today. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure talking about all things ANZ, clerkships and, uh, your experiences studying Mandarin. It's been a pleasure, guys. Thank you very much for having me and good stuff what you're doing. Oh, hopefully Thanks, we, can, we can talk to some more people and, and get some more good stories out there just like yourself. So, uh, yeah, appreciate the time and thanks for coming on, mate. No, awesome. Thanks, guys.